All right, today's topic is going to be fracture mechanics. Um, and we are kind of, uh, we're going to skate across the top of a topic like this uh, because you can go really, really deep into some of the specifics about how uh, cracks begin and then propagate through a piece of material. Okay, but I'm going to give you at least one technique of dealing with this idea that uh, materials can have cracks with them. All right, and it involves uh, what's called a stress intensity factor. So we'll look at that. It is not the stress intensity factor is not a stress concentration factor, although you know it might feel a little bit like it is. Uh, it isn't the same thing as that. So anyway, we're going to get into that uh, with an example problem here in a little bit. I wanted to start off, off today, though, with um, a discussion of cracking more generally in, uh, in engineering materials. So the first picture you see right here where, uh, you know, it looks like essentially the bottom bracket of a bicycle frame, all right? You're used to probably seeing cracks that look something like this crack right here, all right? In other words, they've already gotten to the point where they are large enough for you to see them. Right? And you can kind of get an idea that something's wrong because you see a crack. But what I want to start with here is the idea that there are uh, cracks that start a lot smaller than cracks you eventually see. Okay? As a matter of fact, no material is a perfect lattice. Maybe I shouldn't quite say it that. Most materials are not a perfect ladder, uh, lattice of little elements of, or pieces, you know, little uh, uh, particles of material that are perfectly bonded to other particles of material, okay? So what I'm showing you here, actually, let's go down to the lower right-hand figure right there. What you're seeing is uh, a really polished surface of steel, and it says here it's, uh, it's actually for um, a chromoly steel, but anyway, that doesn't really matter. You're seeing a, a polished surface zoomed in a lot with a scanning electron microscope, and what you're seeing are a lot of little boundaries between grains that make up that material. Okay, the grains themselves, within a particular grain, it generally has a lattice of, uh, you know, kind of a perfect lattice, you, sh you might say, uh, that would be something like face-centered cubic or body-centered cubic, Right? Did you study all those in your materials class? Okay. So within a grain, it behaves that way, but then the entire you know, bulk of material is not just one continuous lattice that's built that way. There are all these boundaries between little grains of material that are each built that way. And it is typically weaker, the material is typically weaker at those boundaries. As a matter of fact, those boundaries can almost be thought of as little cracks waiting to happen. Right? They're not cracks yet because there are bonds that happen from one grain to another grain, but it's like it's a crack waiting to happen. So in other words, it's a, it's a location where the material does not bond as closely because there's that grain boundary between one grain and another. Does that make sense? Okay, so this is what's going on way, way zoomed in on the piece of material. Now here's the thing, all of our theory that we do uh, in, your, in your mechanics and materials classes we typically don't go down to this level and think about a material not being a perfectly continuous spatial, uh, you know, matrix of stuff, right? We think of it, the way most of our math works, we're thinking of it as being completely continuous and we don't have to worry about, you know, the fact that there might not be continuous, uh, continuously equal uh, strength of that material no matter how deep you zoom. Does that make sense? Okay. So where that kind of becomes obvious, if you go over here to this left picture um, below the, the uh, bicycle bracket, you see that uh, here's a crack that has begun to form between uh, the little grains of material. And the grains of material are harder to see in this particular uh, setup, uh, but you, there are actually uh, some little boundaries that you can see between the different grains of material. And what you see there is a crack that has begun to form between those grains, all right? And when cracks start to form, that's typically what happens is they will form in between the actual little grains of uh, metallic material uh, for the metals that we typically deal with in these engineering courses, okay? So what you're seeing there, this is still zoomed in to the point where you can see the little grains, right? You can, it's still a very, very close 
zoom in, but you start to see that there is actually separation and there is no longer a bond between the adjacent grains along that little crack. Okay, so this is basically a crack beginning to form in a little bit larger way. It is still something that you probably wouldn't be able to detect very well unless you had really highly specialized pieces of equipment like scanning electron microscopes, right? It'd be really hard to find that crack probably with, um, with any other kind of a, a tool, all right? Now, one of the things that's tricky is it's important to know whether or not some of the uh, pieces that we build in practice have cracks in them, and sometimes it's hard to find them. I'm gonna give you one example of that. What you see in the upper right, this thing that kind of looks like the eye of Sauron, um, what you see here is this is actually a cross-section through a weld. And I don't know what the weld was for, but it's a cross-section through a weld. And when they completed this weld, uh, due to how the weld cooled, probably, it left a crack right in the middle of the weld. All right, so this is a crack that is not going to be easy or really possible for someone to see from the outside. Like, in other words, you know, once you see this weld, you'd look at it, you'd see up here along the top, that's probably the outer surface of the weld, and you'd, it looks like it's fine. But inside of there, there's a little zone where there's a little crack that has begun to develop. And because of that, this is a spot where you are likely to have uh, more crack propagation. It's a spot that's going to initiate the actual failure of the material, all right? And so this, you have to detect this sometimes. And a very common technique when you are welding, um, you know, parts that have a, a lot of importance, you know, one, one example would be like uh, pressure vessels. Pressure vessels, you don't want them to fail suddenly, right? And, and let out the uh, pressurized interior, kind of becomes almost a bomb at that point. So sometimes what they do, if they want to make sure that these welds uh, are in good shape, is they might x-ray them. And that's where this picture came from. This is an x-ray of a weld that you can see that there's a little uh, crack there in the middle and you would, you would become concerned at that point once you saw that crack there in the middle. So anyway, um, these are some interesting things. I um, want to talk a little bit about um, this idea that's called crack tip blunting. Okay, that sounds like a strange thing. I'm going to um, describe here, so what you see here is a sequence of how a material might actually begin to crack all the way through once you have a crack that has been initiated. Okay, so let's say that you start with a piece of material and for whatever reason, maybe it's due to how it was processed or something like that, something like the weld that we just saw, but let's say that it starts with a crack and the crack has a very sharp tip on one end. From your experience that you've had so far of things like stress concentration factors, what do you think should happen due to that sharp tip being on the end of that crack? Okay. So you remember all of your stress concentration factor charts. Typically, they are plotted against a horizontal axis that basically accounts for the radius of something, right? It's usually some sort of a fillet radius that's along the bottom. And as you get to really, really small fillet radiuses, radii, I guess I should say, as you get to really small ones, what happens to that stress concentration factor? It goes way, way up. As a matter of fact, it kind of looks like it sort of starts to go infinite as that radius gets really, really tiny. So if you have a sharp tip of a crack, what kind of a radius is that? It gets really small. And so you might say, well, that looks like you'd end up with really, really high stresses that would happen at the tip of that crack. And that's actually true. But I want to show you here, there's a progression of things that happen once it begins to fail even more. And this is based on this material that I'm doing right here being ductile. In other words, what I'm about to show you doesn't work so well if this is not a ductile material. Okay. So what happens is there's this little stress field that begins to form right around the little tip right here. So this is like really high stress. Okay, and if this is then a uh, ductile material, what happens is that high stress 
is relieved in the form of the material actually yielding at the end of the tip. All right. And when it begins to yield, the shape of the tip actually becomes more rounded. And that's what you see here. Okay, that's what tends to happen with a ductile material as you begin to pull it apart. If you try to start expanding this tip out, it first starts to blunt that tip. What does that do to the stresses? Yeah, it starts relaxing those stresses some. You don't have the really, really high stress that happens due to that sharp uh, crack tip. Okay, but the thing is, it, that only lasts for so long, right? Uh, materials that are ductile, even ductile materials reach a point where they've had too much uh, deformation and then they also end up fracturing. So if you have a ductile material, what tends to happen is the next phase after the, the uh, tip of the crack has blunted, there becomes another point where at the bottom of that crack, you, you still reach a point where it gets to uh, the point where it would like reach its ultimate strength, for instance and that material would begin to crack at the base of that, and that last phase is called tearing, right? So it's not like this fixes everything, right? The, the idea that you have crack tip blunting, but I wanted to kind of point out that there's this effect that happens that allows us to sort of, um, you know, maybe reduce how much we are worried about cracks if you have ductile material. Does that make sense? Because you have this effect that's called crack tip blunting. All right. Um, this is the last thing I want to cover before I get into our, uh, our example problem. There's a couple of conditions that have to happen in order for a crack to propagate through a piece of material. One of them is exactly what you would expect. One of them is you have to reach uh, your you know, threshold of material strength at the tip of the crack in order for it to break. All right, we would have expected that one, I would, I would say, most of us, okay? The second one is the one that's a little bit more strange. So this is the one I wanna talk about a little bit, okay? The second condition is in the process of your material cracking, it actually involves, at a very small scale, it actually involves little bonds between uh, particles of the material breaking, and when they break, that actually forms new surfaces. Would you agree with that? If you go back up to these pictures of this crack, in order for this crack in this zone right here to begin to propagate some more, it actually had to create these surfaces. Would you agree with that? Okay. So if you're creating those surfaces, a surface of a piece of material actually has to have more energy in order for it to be that way. Let me show you why that is uh, based on, you know, let's say this is a little lattice of material that we have over here, okay? So for this little lattice of material, first thing I'll show you is that on this outer surface up here, all these little green things represent bonds that might crisscross between your various pieces of material, okay? I'm just kind of showing you that those little green things might be bonds that connect all these pieces together. Out here on the surface, if, let's say, you know, any one of these things, and it doesn't have to be eight, but let's say you look at any one of these things and it says that it's got eight bonds around its perimeter, okay? Well, up here on the surface, how many bonds do those four pieces have on the surface? Okay, looks to me like they would have one, two, three, four, five, not eight. Well, if this is a piece of material that wants eight bonds per particle, then it's gonna do something else for those other bonds. What do you think it might do? Okay, they probably start bonding, you know, strangely with the other pieces of material that are on the surface, right? Those extra bonds tend to want to still bond, but they bond with uh, kind of other material, or other, other pieces, other little particles on the surface of the material rather than, you know, something else because it, it's got to do something else there at the surface, right? It still wants to bond, so it creates these different kinds of bonds that happen on the surface. Because the bonds are different, there's an increased amount of energy that happens on the surface of the material than in the bulk of the material. 
all right? It's an increased amount of energy at the surface rather than in the bulk of the material because one of the things that creates energy or that, is, that stores energy, I probably should say, in the matrix of the material is how far you have flexed these bonds, right? There's these little bond angles between your different pieces and on the surface, they typically have to flex more than for the body of the material, okay? This is not a super rigorous treatment of this, but I'm trying to give you at least a qualitative description of how the, the surface of a material ends up with more energy in it than the rest of the material, okay? So let's think about what would happen if we started a crack in this piece of material. A crack would be something like this, okay? These bonds are now broken. and we've created a crack there in the middle. Now that we've broken those bonds, what do you think happens? We've eliminated some of the bonds that each, each particle wants to have with its surrounding particles, right? So what do those things tend to do? Yeah, they try to form bonds with their neighbors, right? And who knows how many of them end up bonding, but you know, they, they basically try to bond with their neighbors, and these try to bond with their neighbors. And in so doing, they basically uh, increase the amount of net energy that is stored in the bonds of the material due to how it has opened up that face, okay? Good so far? Well, so this is why this matters. It takes energy, you have to add energy into this system to form those new surfaces. And what you have to have as a condition for a crack to grow, it has to actually uh, get that energy from strain energy in the, in the material. So in other words, enough strain energy has to be released in the process of forming the new surfaces that it actually supplies that energy that the new surfaces need. Okay? And this is one of the reasons. This, these are kind of two items, the crack tip blunting idea as well as this, uh, this idea that these new surfaces have to be formed that I'm trying to get into essentially showing you why it is that we care that something might be ductile, okay? Um, the idea of toughness in a material is basically how much a material can absorb energy before it actually fractures, before it fails, okay? And if you think about the, uh, the two curves, stress versus strain curves for a ductile material versus a brittle material, which one do you think can absorb more energy before it actually fails? Okay, I hear a few people voting for the ductile material. Why is that? Okay, yeah, the, because of the plastic region, it gets a lot of deformation at a high stress, right? And that represents a, a good amount of energy that it basically is absorbing from its surroundings. If you might remember when we talked about strain energy, uh, the amount of strain energy density was equal to one half stress times strain. Do you remember that? If you don't remember it, you can go back and, and check out that lecture. But we, we actually derived and said that the strain energy density is one half stress times strain. And so you can see there, for ductile materials, they can absorb quite a bit more energy before they begin to fail, okay? That actually, you know, that energy goes into things like the production of new surfaces. It also can be thought of in terms of these cracks being blunted at the tips. And what we conclude is that when a material is more ductile, okay, it is typically more tough against fracture right? It, it can handle it. It basically will not uh, kind of quickly fracture brittily um, as, as soon, okay? And what I'm going to basically say here is that there is this inverse relationship between uh, the strength of a material and it's this other parameter that's called fracture toughness, okay? So uh, ultimate strength and fracture toughness or actually I guess I'll say yielding strength and fractured toughness. Yielding strength and fracture toughness 
are inversely, re are inversely related. Okay, and it, the way that you think about this, um, let's say you have a, a type of steel, and you can process that steel to where you increase its, uh, its yielding strength. What's one way that you can do that? Cold work, right? Cold work is one of the most obvious ones, right? So if you cold work a material, you basically work it to the point where it gets up in this uh, ductile region, and then you relax it, and the new stress-strain curve looks something more like this. So it won't yield until it gets to this point right there, and then it goes on, right? So you've actually increased its yielding strength. But what else have you done? You've decreased its capacity to absorb energy, okay? So that is the reason, or that's one reason, one way to think about why it is that yielding strength and fracture toughness are inversely related. So you can make the material stronger, but you've also made it to where it has more tendency to fail brittily than before, okay? So these are some ideas that I want you to sort of have uh, qualitatively in your mind before we get into our, our example problem that we're gonna work today.